We have two Old Testament lessons. The first is Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5, and then Psalm 8. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And now from the book of Psalms, Psalm 8, hear these words. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have found the bore because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the birds of the field, the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, how sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Meet each of us right where we are. May it lead the meditations in our hearts and in our minds. May they be acceptable in your sight. And lead us, O Lord, to the table for holy communion. Lead us in life for holy living. Come, Holy Spirit, come, we pray. Amen. So today we set out on a journey that will take us through the Apostles' Creed. We are accustomed to offering this creed most every Sunday as we gather here at the 11 o'clock service. But we're going to go through it, breaking it down, kind of in a sense, line by line. And as we go through this journey, each sermon will stand on its own, though it will build upon the one before it. But please do not think for a moment that we, in focusing upon the creed, will not be focusing upon the scriptures. For the Apostles' Creed is a summary statement, if you will, of what we have in the 66 books of the Bible and just as the Bible tells a story from Genesis to Revelation, the creed, as much as it is a statement of our faith, it too tells a story that begins with God, who's Father Almighty, one who creates, and then tells the story of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the church, and finishes with life everlasting. It is the same story of the Bible, but it's kind of a, a Cliff Notes version, if you will condensed into one page of the Bible. It's a concise statement of the faith that enables us to lift up the message of the Bible when we stand together in, in an act of worship on Sunday morning. And in doing so, we are saying that this is who we are as Christians. This is what we believe and know to be true about God. And I don't know if we really think about this, but it is a gift to be able to stand and to offer this creed every single time we offer it. It is a gift to stand in one accord and acknowledge that we belong to something far greater than ourselves, that we belong to God and we belong to one another. What a gift to be able to make such a statement of faith from time to time when the stuff of life can get in the way, when we've been sidelined by pressing issues of the day or troubling events, or we've experienced an event in life that has shaken us to our very core and our very faith, and we're troubled. Even when we are in a place of doubt, we can hear the church declaring the words that remind us of what we are to believe as Christians and when we might be in a place of unbelief, we can hear the church profess it and kind of lead us back, drawing us back in. From when we are faced with the reality of death of a loved one and prayers for healing have offered and they seemingly go unanswered and we gather on a Sunday morning and we hear about believing in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Wow, that can be met in our place of anguish and unbelief but the church willing to share these words we know to be true 
On any given Sunday, we are in different places spiritually. There are some who are coming on a Sunday morning who are in their season of life. They are just hitting their stride as they're living out their faith, strong in their faith. But even as there are people who are really strong in their faith, there are those who are just setting out with a mixture of curiosity and questions and perhaps are responding to the, the nudges of the Holy Spirit in ways that they had never responded before. And still others who have spent time chasing after other gods and are perhaps in a place of great humility and vulnerability and are saying, while the church has this statement of belief, I believe, but help my unbelief. Like the father of that sick child who came to Jesus for healing. Together with our differing situations and stations in life, we're invited to share a statement of faith that directs our attention away from ourselves, away from what's going on in the world, and we are to focus upon God. I mean, really, that's what worship is about, where we turn our attention away from what's going on in our world and to focus upon God so that we can stay focused upon God in the midst of whatever's going on in the world in which we live. And so we're guided by this statement to focus upon our God who is the one true God who is the Almighty on the one hand and loving on the other. Legend has it that this creed dates back to the original apostles. After all, it, it bears their name. The legend begins with the disciples gathered around the table and Peter started out first. I mean, what did you expect? Peter always seems to speak up first. And what does Peter say? I believe in God the Father Almighty. And by the time they got around the table, every apostle added a line to complete the creed. Certainly that's the thing of legends. It is appropriately called the Apostles' Creed because it encompasses the faith of the early church, but it was most likely written sometime in the 5th century, though there was an early creed called the Old Roman Creed that comes from the 2nd or 3rd century. I mean, these creedal statements have been around as long as the scriptures have been around. And even within the scriptures, we have some creedal statements. We have some statements about our faith. In Deuteronomy, we have the Shema in a culture where there were many gods, or at least the understanding that there were many gods. The people of Israel were invited to confess their faith in the one true God. And what do we hear? Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God the Lord alone. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then in the letters from Paul, we have one in here, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.14, where he writes, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Again, that's a simple statement of faith. We need to hold on to these statements and live by these statements, these truths that guide us. You know, given today's climate in the United Methodist Church, which we are being accused of changing our beliefs, I think it's important that we focus upon that which is essential. And yes, we're not compromising our beliefs. We're not compromising that which is essential. And so I believe the timing is right to go deeper into this creed, this creed that we say all the time and lift it up and draw attention to the various aspects of God and how we relate to God as Christians. As we look at the Apostles' Creed, we're speaking of the essentials of our faith. We are stating this is what distinguishes us from people of other faiths. This is what distinguishes us between us and Jews and Muslims and still others. And I think it's important from time to time to return to the basics. And that's what we're doing in this series, returning to the basics, if you will, to talk about what we believe and what we believe truly matters for our beliefs are to inform the way we live it is to inform our way of thinking our practices just what we do not just on a Sunday morning but what we do every single day it is to guide how we view others and hopefully guides our belief in such a way that we are living out our faith in a rather particular way, a, a, a distinctively and unapologetically way as a Christian. 
if our beliefs are not being lived out in a particular way, distinctive from others, then our friends who are not in church, non-believers, will look at us and wonder, what are you doing going to worship? What are you doing reading the scriptures if there's no difference between you and me? The best argument or proof we have of God is living transformed lives, people who are touched by the grace of God. And we're not just adhering to statements of faith that can be empty when they're just mere words, but when we take them to heart and understand them to be true, a, a guiding principle, a guiding light in our life. So right from the beginning of the creed, we're invited to do what? To turn our attention away from ourselves and to turn our attention, to guide our attention to God. And we are invited to turn our attention to God throughout the creed. And actually, we're to turn to God each and every day, not just when we're making a statement. And notice that the creedal statement doesn't say, we believe in a general God. I'm fully aware that many people in our country have an understanding that there is a God, and they will refer to God in general terms, even as they might seek other gods and get caught up in their earthly pursuits. In some ways, it may be comfortable to speak of God in just general terms, because we can, well, we can keep God, who's general enough, distant keeping a safe place from this general God and us. But when we come to understand that God is not just an omnipotent and supreme being, but God who reveals God's self in a particular way through the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then, then, well, we're going to give attention, greater attention to this God who comes into our lives and seeks to get our attention and transform us and desires that we are in relationship with God. According to Pew Research, the trend has been that more and more Americans don't believe in God, and today one-third of Americans believe in God only as a supreme and omnipotent being or higher power, but only slightly more than half of Americans believe in the God as described in the Bible. See, belief in a general God, it's one thing. It can be a start. But how life-changing is that? Now, I think for those who are going through Alcoholics Anonymous, we know it as AA, seeing that there is a power beyond themselves to help them conquer and live with their addiction is a great start because they've become aware that the addiction has a power over their lives and the choices they make. And they're invited to seek a higher power. And as Christians, we're invited, we invite others who have come to be aware of this higher power and encourage them to know this higher power more intimately, more personally. As Christians, we know that God doesn't just want to be known as an omnipotent, omnipotent being or higher power. And we're given the gift to name this name of God as Father Almighty. Father and Almighty are two words to describe God that don't seem, they, they seem to be a, a rather odd pairing. But let's unpack it so that we can once again appreciate what this signifies and, and offers to us. God is Almighty. And Almighty is closely a close word to word, powerful. I mean, God is certainly a God of power, but also a God of love and grace and mercy. When we think of God as powerful and mighty, we might stand in all of this God and then fear this God. We do read in the scriptures that the beginning of wisdom is what? The fear of the Lord. But if God were only almighty, we might want to keep our distance. Don't get too close out of a sense of respect, yes, but also out of a sense of security and safety. Jürgen Moltmann said, omnipotence can be feared, but never loved. And what we know about God as early as the first chapter of the Bible is that God created humankind so that we might be in fellowship with God, be in relationship with God. So sure, we have 
to have proper fear and respect for God, but if we all, if all we have is fear of God and see God as Almighty, then God may seem impersonal. And we would want to keep a healthy distance with such a powerful God whose power would not only get our attention but could very well intimidate us. And when we are intimidated by another human being, we are either going to always be on edge when we're in their presence or we're going to look for an out when we are in their presence. Our God certainly doesn't want an out. But God, who is almighty, desires to have a loving relationship with each of us. In this first line of the creed, we acknowledge God's power and might. But before the word almighty, we have a word that signifies a relationship. And Jesus invites us to call upon God in the same way that he called upon God. So while Jesus lived here on the earth, he had a particular way of addressing God. Whenever he'd go up the mountain to pray, he would say, Abba. Abba is the Aramaic word that a small child would direct to a dad. Can't you envision a mother reaching down to her, her child and the child looking up with outstretched arms saying, Mama, Mama, or a young child looking up to the dad saying, Daddy. It's an endearing term that many children never outgrow. Jesus, the Son of God, was in a relationship with the first person of the Godhead, God the Father, and he taught us when we pray, he told us to pray in a particular way, our Father, our Abba, who art in heaven. And such a relationship is a gift that we're able to come before God as God's children and address God in such a way as our parent, if you will. Sounds scriptural. Let the little children come unto me. Do not stop them, for to such as these the kingdom of heaven belongs. Now, I, I realize to refer to God as Father is a stumbling block to those who may not have had or had a relationship, a loving relationship with their, their dad. And, and so calling God Father doesn't come easy or may not seem right. And to others, it may seem too patriarchal and just one more way of showing male dominance as we project this upon God and calling forth submission. As we refer to God, we must understand that any language we use is analogical. Our finite language can never fully express the infinite nature of just who God is, God's total being. And so the words that we use, Father, Mother, Loving, Creator, Almighty, cannot possibly encompass all of who God is or tell the whole story and we should never try to fit God into boxes of our own choosing and then live with the limits that come with our language our culture or our personal likings as we seek at times to make God in our image rather than worshiping a God who made us in God's image when we say God the Father we are not talking gender we're talking relationship. And we need to be in awe of all of who God is as the great I am. And even as we have this understanding of this awesomeness of God and God as infinite being in the heavenly realm, we have to understand that this God, our God, desires to be known personally. When we state Father Almighty, we have a powerful presence that desires to be intimately known and loved. And the love we have with God in this relationship is far greater than the greatest human relationship we have with another person. And just as we cannot fully capture the final, infinite nature of God, there are places in Scripture where God is described in maternal language. So for those who get all upset when people use maternal language to describe God, just remember there are places in Scripture that support it. As in Deuteronomy, when God is portrayed as the mother in the birth of Israel, or when Israel says that God is like a nursing mother, or elsewhere in Isaiah, when God comforts like a mother, comforting a frightened child, or when Jesus says, How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And so our struggle with language and culture and gender, guess what? That's about us. It's 
not about who God is. Instead of getting defensive or irritated with the other, we would do well to be encouraged, to encourage one another to have that wonderful relationship with God, one that can be described intimately and endearing as Jesus called God, Abba. Been here now for about a year, and so you are accustomed to the way I, I speak about God in language, and, and, and maybe you learn or sense how seldom I use the word he as a pronoun for God, nor do I say she. But I will say Father Almighty, Heavenly Father, not associating with gender, but always in terms of describing that blessed relationship we have with our loving God. In the prayer that Jesus taught us, he gives us the gift of how we can address our God, who is omnipotent, yes, and almighty, for when we use the same enduring term Jesus used, God, though, is not distant. God's love seems ever close. You know, I need, you need a God that has a power and calls forth from us respect and has the power to rescue and deliver us. But we also need a God that we can simply talk to and, and relate to in our everyday experiences, intimately being in relationship with our God. So how wonderful as Christians we can say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.